Okay, welcome all. I hope you uh, can hear us loud and clear. Uh, this is Leo uh, speaking from Sydney today in uh, in lockdown, uh, and very very happy to uh, you know to see you all uh, connect for this uh, new edition of Startup and Angel. Uh, today we'll be focusing on how to grow your uh, your startup internationally, leveraging technology. Uh, and we've uh, <clears throat> basically came up with this uh, new event uh, format, uh, you know, obviously to adapt uh, to the situation, uh, being in lockdown here and, you know, few of you, uh, except the one in, uh, in, in sunny Adelaide, um, being um, banned from uh, public events. Uh, today, uh, you know, we, we've put together um, a panel uh, of experts, um, you know, with with Cynthia Derin, will be moderating the moderating the panel, um, including Chris Horn from Salesforce App Exchange, uh, Fred Viet from Aircore, Phil De Winter from Airwalex, and David Kenny from Hold Shadwick and and the Starmate Mentor. Uh, so we definitely have you know a lot of uh, expertise and thought leadership. When it comes to you know both technology and uh, you know successful businesses, um, we we'll have uh, a section, uh, a first section uh, where you'll all be uh, allocated to breakout rooms, uh, basically to give you uh, the opportunity to meet new people one on one, uh, as well as you know pitch uh, what you're working on at the moment, uh, share some of the challenge and. Uh, you know, have discussion in small groups about how to solve them. Uh, we'll continue the, the panel discussion and we'll finish by another a bit longer uh, networking session uh, where you'll meet, uh, you know, other, other people in, in that section. So be uh, ready to actually, you know, um, use your camera and your mic uh, when we um, turn into the, the networking session. Um, a number of you, uh, you know, are already members of our community, Startup and Angels. Uh, for those of you who um, don't know this community, that's something we launched just over one year ago on the back of a five-year journey you now with Startup and Angels. Uh, our mission here is really to connect uh, early stage or founders uh, and scale-up uh, executives uh, with investors, uh, with new technology partners, and with potential clients uh, globally. Uh, we've got a strong footprint in Asia Pacific and Australia especially. And uh, we've now launched this online community where we got just over 700 members uh, across 150 startups, uh, VC, and accelerator program. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get the opportunity to join the community, create your profile if you haven't not already done so. Uh, and the, the community, uh, you know, is, is free and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, up to you to make the, the most of it. A uh, few words about our company at the back of Startup and Angel. Basically, Australians, we are connectors. Uh, our mission is really to help uh, create meaningful connections. Uh, and we've got few concepts, Australians Access, which is really helping um, scale-ups from Australia or internationally to go to new markets. Australian talent is our talent acquisition arm uh, where we help you know, attract and hire top talents, uh, mainly in Australia and Australian's network, uh, basically where we have you know, a number of concepts such as startup and angels uh, and a conference uh, called B2B Rocks that run both in Europe and Australia. Uh, in, uh, we also have you know, a couple of new concepts we are launching this year. Australian's impact uh, you know, as part of our pledge 1%. Uh, and Australian Ventures will be looking at helping early stage HR tech startups uh, get off the ground uh, in Australia. Uh, a big, big thanks to basically all the partners of Startup and Angel. Uh, you know, as you can see, our events are you know, free for our members and very, very affordable. Uh, the idea here is really to you know, uh, help uh, early stage companies uh, and all individuals uh, to access knowledge and network. And we couldn't be running uh, Startup and Angels without uh, some amazing partners 
such as OVH Cloud, uh, or Platinum Partner, Aircall, Fondsquire, and Old Shadwick, who joined as new partner this year. Uh, so really, really looking forward to welcoming them uh, as part of the community, as well as Salesforce, App Exchange, and you know, pledge one percent. Um, you know, as we mentioned, uh, and you know, very, very keen to uh, have each of you join the pledge one percent movement. Uh, basically, um, you know, helping to have a, uh, an impact on you know great causes such as uh, you know education, climate change, uh, or fighting poverty. So without further ado, I'll hand over uh, to Cynthia uh, to um, you know, moderate, the, moderate the panel. Uh, thanks to all of you. Don't hesitate to um, tell us who you are in the, in the chat, uh, you know, ask questions, and um, we'll, we'll also kick off a few polls uh, so we understand who is in the audience today. Enjoy the discussion, and up to you, Cynthia. Up, oh, Cynthia. Cynthia, we can't hear you. I'm muted. I'm unmuted. Thank you. I was just going to say, I can see we have a few people coming to the waiting room. They keep popping up. So we just need to make sure we let them in. Um, hey, everyone. It is great to be with you today. Um, I'm really excited about this event. We have an outstanding panel. You are going to learn a ton of stuff from them. Uh, and I'm also glad because I know a lot of us are locked down at the moment, and this is a great opportunity to get some real engagement with some real people, even though we are in a virtual room together and not a real room. To that end, could I get everyone, unless you are driving the car or, you know, walking and worried about walking into a signpost or a tree or horribly disfigured for some reason, could I get you to put your camera on and your microphone off so we can make this as real as possible uh, and so that we can have great quality audio for uh, anybody who's listening afterwards. We're going to do a quick intro to the panel now, and I can't introduce the panel as well as they can introduce themselves. So I am going to let them introduce themselves, but I will get us started. And I'll do 30 seconds on me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cynthia Deeran. I am the founder of Deeran and Associates, and that is a consulting company that helps companies to scale internationally from Australia to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world to the rest of the world. Um, I'm also the author of this book, which is getting released tomorrow, and we will talk about that a little bit later on the call. Super excited to be with you here today. And I think I will do this in order of company. So Fred, can I get you to introduce yourself as our first panel member for the day, please? Please welcome Fred Viet from Aircall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was looking at the corporate picture of the slide before, and it's fun to see that everyone is in lockdown and they've got crazy haircut like uh, like I've got. So I, it's quite to see this difference between reality and on corporate picture. Uh, my name is Fred Viet. Uh, I'm a French guy who joined Australia. I moved to Australia 10 years ago. I've been in in uh, IT industry for 18 years now. Um, I'm mainly in big enterprise like Microsoft, uh, Amazon Web Services. And at the end of the year, I, uh, I dropped a big corporate job and I, I jumped to a, a small uh, startup. I would say a scale-up now, Aircall. So uh, what we do, we are a cloud-based uh, phone system. And uh, it's very simple. They've decided to say, okay, we need to grow worldwide. Australia is a good target. Let's go and build a team locally. Um, my job is to lead uh, the uh, INZ on pack team here for Aircall. Thank you. Super. Uh, let's hear now from Phil De Winter from Airwallex. Phil is our director of partnerships at that company. Thanks, Cynthia. Hey, everyone. Phil De Winter, great to meet you. Uh, usually based in Melbourne, but luckily, about a month ago, escaped up to the Gold Coast. So um, I've been seeing out lockdown up here. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, Director of Partnerships at Airwallex. And um, Airwallex, we are providing financial infrastructure for businesses to grow their businesses globally. Um, we raised um, close to $400 million last year um, to, to help achieve that, that, that mission, which is, is really exciting. Um, previous to my, my role at Airwallex, I um, headed up the, the business development team at FanHub and uh, a sports tech startup and opened their, their UK office and opened their, their US office and, and lived in New York up in you know, pre-COVID. Pre so 
have a bit of experience in um, scaling scaling businesses globally and I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing that experience with you today. Super, thank you. David Kenny. So David Kenny is a partner with Hall Chadwick and he's also from Startmate. David, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Cynthia. And thanks, uh, Leah, for organising this. Uh, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, I'm a partner at uh, Hall Chadwick and probably 20 years ago, I fell in love with helping startups when I saw uh, a couple of people that I was working with out of universities um, hit, hit the ball out of the, the park, you know, for big, big um, hits. And um, since then, I've been involved with uh, helping companies raise capital. Um, get, I've, I think I've worked on over 300 exits, uh, doing a lot of um, things, getting ready for people to grow. My main, I guess, main driver is helping people actually increase their revenue. I'd like to get another companies, another 10 companies if I could to uh, that uh, $100 million level of income or, or a billion dollar exit. Um, I'm on several advisory boards uh, of startups, but also on some VCs, uh, involved in VCs. I'm an angel investor. And um, pretty much the things that mainly uh, I focus on from day to day are other companies raising money, selling, uh, getting their structures right, getting things right for overseas expansion and all the different taxes and issues and hiring and capital and um, and coordinating things so that you know the founder doesn't get in trouble down the track uh, when they get an exit or if um, you know, the last thing you want to do is get arrested at LAX. Um, so those sorts of things are, are things that I usually get asked to do, make sure we don't get our ass burnt while we're going out there and uh, making some money So and uh, have, have a lot of fun doing it at the same time. And I'm also a director of um, Startup Grind Sydney, uh, and um, unfortunately, we're in lockdown. Um, as you know, my next guest is going to be uh, Luke Anir. Um, but again, we had to postpone Luke until the office is open again. Super. Thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, Chris Horn, who is a VP with Salesforce App Exchange. Chris, welcome to the stage. Hello. Thanks, Cynthia. Hey, everyone. And like Fred, I'm about a, a month overdue for a haircut as well, coming to you live from Sydney in lockdown. Uh, but uh, yeah, really happy to be here. Um, so I'm Chris Horn. I lead the, the app exchange business for APAC at Salesforce. Uh, so I've been with the business about two and a half years. Uh, before that, I was in, um, in management consulting for about five years, really focused on, on go-to-market strategy. Uh, and before that, I was really in startup land for about 10 years. So I was a, an employee and an, a, an investor in a few startup and scale-up businesses here in Australia and in Southeast Asia as well. In a range of different sales, marketing, product, and, uh, and GM roles. Uh, but in my current role, I guess myself and my team, we really help entrepreneurs to conceptualize and, and build apps on the Salesforce platform, and then help those founders to really grow and accelerate, you know, particularly into the, the US and European markets. Um, so pumped to be here and um, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Should be good fun. Super. So let's kick it off. Um... I love talking about mistakes and problems because it always gets people in these events listening. So my question, first question for the panel is what mistakes have you made or you seen other people make as they try to scale their business internationally? I might pick on Chris first because you went last. What have you seen in this space? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia. Look, I think the the challenge that we see a lot or the mistake is, is the assumption that the go-to-market will take care of itself if the product is right in your home market. And we see this, you know, within APAC, particularly with really technical founders, it's a, it's a more common challenge, uh, but also on the expansion side as well. So I think that's one. I think, I think linked to that is the a common one is lack of focus in strategy. So I think particularly with apps that have a more horizontal offering that don't have a, you know, specific industry or segment, I think um, if the strategy is to kind of crack the US market, for example, I think you have to really stop and kind of rethink. Like that's an objective, uh, not a strategy. Um, so I think that that focus piece is really important. And uh, I think a third point would be around just kind of starting from zero. You know, I think when you're trying to enter a mature market, if you're doing it without any initial tests or experiments to learn from, um, or haven't been, you know, made some sort of inroads remotely and have a couple of customer references behind you, I think that's really when, um, you know, that can be a bit of a bit more of a grind to mm. get up and running. So yeah. that'd, be, that'd be three things. Those all completely resonate with me, I have to say. Who else wants to jump in on that one? Happy to jump in, Cynthia. I think um, a real 
big mistake that a lot of Aussie Aussie companies make, and have made this mistake myself, is grouping mark big markets as one big market and having the same strategy for that big market. So let's take Europe for example. People think, oh yeah, we can open hire someone in London, set up a UK office, and that's our that's our foot into in, into Europe, and you know we can we can tackle the whole European market. The European market is really complicated and um, really fragmented, and it, it it doesn't work that way in in practice. And and likewise in the states, like. I think, you know, having, having lived there for quite some time, you know, the East coast is very different to the West coast, which is very different to, again, to middle America. Right. And um, if you, if you group all of those territories together, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for, for some headaches early on. Um, so really picking which of those segments you, you're going after is a really crucial part of your go to market and important to take into consideration as you, as you're looking to expand overseas. Yeah, so it's really all fo- about focus, 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 right? Exactly right. Fantastic. David, what about you? These are mistakes that would be hard to limit it to, to uh, a few, but I think the, the classic <laughs> things are really, you know, when people are expanding overseas, that, that first uh, employee overseas, often they'll um, start doing things which will break the rules in another country. Um, if we start employing people, uh, there's either ability to... Uh, trigger income tax liabilities in foreign jurisdictions. There's um, breaking employment rules. There's break, all sorts of things. So people have got to get a really good understanding of how to employ in that country and what does it mean in Australia because it will come out in due diligence or, or getting fined. That's a key one. Um, also just how they manage the things like R&D claims when you've got, you know, you set something up first in Australia or in the US maybe, and then have an Australian subsidiary, you've got to constantly be charging the services that you're providing to the other country. So you've got, you're straight away into things that are complex like transfer pricing, and that's a real nuisance. And that can also be a problem when it comes to the ongoing assignment of the, of the work product producer or the IP when it comes to claiming R&D. And because you've got to be in a loss position after adding back the, the um uh, you know, the uh, R&D claim. So then there's the founders themselves. They move overseas and, and all of a sudden they're subject to foreign jurisdiction taxes and they've still got issues going on in Australia and they turn up and they might be lucky enough to have the principal place of residence still from, you know, Sydney and they find out, hang on, that's taxable in the US now that they've arrived if they sell it. So there's a bunch of little trivia things that just people need to be aware of that, um, you need to keep keep out of trouble and issuing options overseas when you've got Australian staff members and Australian plans and US plans. And the countries don't play nicely with each other. There's a lot of um, rules that need to be managed and payment options. And when you're paying, you know, money overseas, W8 bands, there's just a bunch of trivia that needs to be taken care of because it's pretty draconian fines for founders to, um, to cop. And the last thing you want to do is um, go back to an investor and say, I need some more money for, for this error or, or be pulled up in a, you know, on, on, on a sale of your company and you know, held up in due diligence unnecessarily. So you've got to get the laws right. If you're going to do, operate in Australia, you've got to assume and find out real, real fast what the laws internationally are. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. Uh, Fred, I'm going to throw to you as the last person on this particular question. What have you seen? Or, or done. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the biggest mistake I've seen sometimes is uh, coming on, on thinking, okay, I'm a US company, I've got my US metrics and I'm going to apply them to a. Oh. Fred, we've. Can you hear me? We, we are breaking up a bit. We might need to just get you to put your camera off for a moment to try and see if we can get the sound back. Yeah, you hear me. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, the biggest mistake is some to uh, because it's what country we're going to apply the same metric to another country. And uh, I've seen that a lot. Sometimes US company coming to another uh, country, like uh, I would say, could be another geo like uh, EMEA or APAC, trying to have the metrics in terms of productivity, thinking in the same market. And it's not, you know, your productivity are going to be different, your go-to-market are going to be more local. So that's for me the, the first thing. It's good to think globally, but you need to adapt your mail to a, a local market. The second challenge as well is, are you going to bring your, your people and move them locally? So I would say take key people from US moving them to Australia. 
to have the right culture or are, are you going to hire local people who's got the network, who's got the knowledge? And I've seen too many companies uh, sending their own people, they know the company, they know the product, but they are missing completely the network on uh, how to integrate quickly to uh, to the local market. So uh, I think it's something very important to consider. Thank you. A quick question. Has anybody seen particular mistakes around pricing that they want to share or particular challenges around pricing? I know we, we discussed this when we were chatting amongst ourselves earlier, and I think that that's quite an interesting one. Has anybody got a point on that? Yeah, happy to jump in, Cynthia. That's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, look, I, I think with pricing, I often kind of relate that back to the sort of broader issues with the localized value proposition. You know, so quite often if, if pricing is an issue, then the offering might not be coming across as compelling and as targeted as it needs to be, um, which again, I think it comes back to what I know we'll talk about a lot today, I'm sure, which is that focus piece. Um, if your value proposition is too broad, you know, the solution, um, you know, isn't, isn't focused enough and, you know, the market testing isn't, um, isn't sort of validating. So I've, I've certainly seen some examples where like pricing expectations for a particular type of app are sometimes different in a in a new market, perhaps due to some local competitive dynamics that have gone on there. Um, so I think that'd be a good example where that, that value proposition and offering, you know, might need to be rethought from what it looks like in the home market to make sure that the pricing issue isn't popping up in the you know the new market we're trying to enter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Anybody else on that one? Well, you've got to take into account yeah. different state taxes. GST, VAT, um, you know, which currency you're in. Um, different countries give better deals if you've got a local subsidiary for issues like Stripe issues. There's, there's just a million pieces of trivia for how you, you know, what, what, what your leakages are from your revenue and trying to, you know, minimise any costs of, of operating in, in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding, you know, your competitiveness, like Chris was talking about, but also... You know, what what are the what are the great tips and tricks and that's what we're I guess we're on the call for today to sort of share some uh, you know, inner sanctum wisdom on you know where the hacks are to, to save some money and get your get your uh, your runway uh, extended a little bit by being able to you know keep the money in your company longer and spend it on more things that you know increase your value yeah, absolutely. So we are going to go to a breakout room in a minute. But before we get there, I do have a controversial question for the panel. Um, and my controversial question is this, where do you think companies should be looking at as their first target market when it comes to international expansion? I mean, we've got people who've had experience in, in different markets and have preferences for different markets. So um, I'd love to get some views from the panel. Should people be looking at Europe? Should people be looking at the US? Should people be looking at Southeast Asia? Why, why not? What do you guys think? I can give you a good good, good little story on this one. Um, so my previous role at Fan Hub, I, I think I mentioned we sort of opened UK and, and New York. Um, we were, I had one foot on the plane going about to open the New York office. Um, that was going to be our first road to international expansion. And then... Um, about two weeks before we, we were meant to get on the plane, um, we landed our biggest biggest deal overnight with a, a customer in the UK. So very quickly, the the uh, the plan changed, right? And I think there's a little bit of follow the money there, right? Where you you, you where, where the business is and where the, the low hanging fruit. I think if you can get that um, that right, will really be helpful. You know, in hindsight, what was really great about that experience is I think we would have struggled in the US without the credibility of a lot of the customers we've been working with in the UK and Europe yeah. um, and having worked with some really you know, impressive brands in the UK like you know, brands like News Corp and Eurosport and some, some you know, world renowned names um, then you know, when we got to the US it made, made it a lot easier than to go and pitch to the NFL or to the NBA and, and win contracts with those, with those customers so um, you know, I think sometimes like the US know a lot more about what's going on in the UK than they do what's going on in Australia and that can be a nice little progression to, to get there to, to your own point. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Anybody else? Does yeah. somebody have a contrary view I, on this? I'd love to hear one. <laughs> I mean, there's not, there's not a straight answer saying you should go there or there. there. Every single country, they've got their specificity. Uh, so I, as an example, we are, we are a European-based company. And uh, one thing we knew is 
as soon as we started our business, we decided to go on attack the U.S. market. Uh, based on that, we decided to go on expand in, uh, in Australia as well because it was easier in terms of collaterals, uh, English-speaking country, uh, mature market. So I, I think, you know, if you look at those, those three, four major geo, Europe is not one big continent, but it's like a multitude of, of country. You go to, to APAC, it's more like emerging market with, with different things. So it's back to your, to your product on the your proposition on uh, how quickly on, I would say, how fast you can transport this value proposition to another market. So uh, it's not like a straight answer for me. That makes my, sense. My, my quick take, Cynthia, is it's really just going where you need to be to look at access to markets, obviously we've touched on, uh, where those marquee customers are, which give you that momentum, but also access to talent. I mean, not everyone has to go to Silicon Valley to, to get good talent. I mean, big commerce went to uh, Austin and, and uh, you know, listed last year on the uh, most oversubscribed company in the last five years, and they, they featured uh, in Austin. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to Europe if there's some great customers, clients, um, access to talent. Uh, there's also each country, a lot of countries also give a lot of different grants at, from time to time and sandbox issues in the UK and, um, you know, EIS concessions and all, all sorts. There's people are competing globally for, for founders to go and start businesses in different um, locations. So you just need to be across that. And also where some of the best other founders are, because often founders get a lot of value from other founders that they can sort of collaborate with. So you've just got to look at talent, capital and pricing of rounds is also vastly different in different countries too for the same business possibly. Yeah. I mean, I like to look at this one as a kind of the intersection of three overlapping circles. You know, if you think of opportunity, feasibility and profitability, like a, Zen di a Venn diagram, that's kind of your most basic overlap that you can get and you're looking at. And you need to do it on the basis of some data. You know, you can't just go on a holiday somewhere and say, oh, I love it, let's set up a business here. Although I know people who've tried to do that, it did not work well. Um, so, you know, you need to be looking at that and kind of using some formal analysis on what's the size of the opportunity? Is this going to be feasible? You know, can we do it? And actually, can we make any money out of it if we can? So, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's one way that I like to look at it. Okay, Leo's probably going to kill me because we're already running – uh, about eight minutes late. So I'm going to like close out part one of the panel. And I think uh, the team is going to put us into breakout rooms. Leo, I might just hand back to you to remind us what the questions are that we're going to talk about in this breakout session. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so we have our first break. Uh, so be ready to Turn your camera on uh, and unmute un yourself once in the in the room. Uh, the idea here is uh, so it'll be you'll be randomly allocated to uh, very small rooms uh, of five, uh, including uh, a speaker and a moderator. Um, and the idea is to give you the opportunity to you know introduce yourself, uh, what you're currently working on, uh, and if you have one uh, key challenge. Uh, you know, when expanding or leveraging technology, um, you know, on some of the themes we, we've covered today to share with the, with the audience. Uh, we'll probably have uh, the break um, for about 12, uh, 15 minutes. So you'll have uh, roughly two to three minutes each, um, you know, to, uh, to interact. Uh, and then we'll go back um, to, the, to the panel discussion uh, on, the, um, on the second section, which will be most focused on, you know, must do uh, and, you know, which technology uh, you can use for, for your business. Um, so I'll let um, Florencia take over uh, and uh, send us to respective breakout rooms. Uh, I'll see you shortly. Uh, there may be a few people joining back. Good to see all, all your face now. Uh, and then unmute and I um, uh, hope you enjoyed the session, met some uh, new great people. Um, I will give the floor back to uh, Cynthia for the second part of the panel. Awesome. Thank you, Leo. So I hope everyone had a fun time in, in their breakout room. We did. I met some really interesting people. We had a great discussion about international stuff and also how we're dealing with lockdown. We've talked about problems. We're going to spend the rest of our time together 
nutting out some solutions. So my question for the panel, and you guys can jump in whatever order you would prefer, prefer is, um, in your domain, and on this panel, we've got uh, somebody specialised in sales, we've got somebody specialised in payments, we've got somebody specialised in communications, and we've got somebody specialised in legal and regulatory. So in your particular domain, Phil, Chris, Fred, and David, what is the, the one thing that a company expanding internationally has to get right? I'll, I'll, I'll jump off if you want. Oh, sorry, you, yeah. Yeah, apologies for that. Just, uh, you know, how you get an important call, they're really the worst possible time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll try um, to so, Yeah, for so, me, yeah, you go. You go, Fred. For me, what is very important is, uh, is your tech stack. You're going to go worldwide. And on, when I mean worldwide, it can be as well remote. So you need to understand that your people are going to work not anymore close to your in the same office. They are going to, it's going to go after talent at worldwide level in every single country. So you need to have a tech, a tech stack that allow you to coach your people, communicate uh, uh, on a good way with them. That means I'm not going to be able to speak with them uh, all the time, but it will be asynchronous as well. So very important when you start is to think and spend the time to have the right tech stack that will help you to grow acquire and retain talent all over the world, making sure they can communicate together and uh, making sure you can, I would say, develop your culture because we didn't spoke about that, but uh, more and more important is your company culture. And you want to make sure that all the IT will help you to, uh, I would say, push that uh, across remote on different countries. That is super helpful. Thank you. Uh, Phil De Winter. Cool. Yeah, I remember sitting, um, we, got, we got to New York, um, needed to pay staff. We just expanded into the States and we were trying to open a bank account. Um, I spent a week in HS, uh, sorry, a week at Chase trying to open a bank account for them to tell me, sorry, you're fully owned by an Australian uh, subsidiary. Um, you know, we're not going to open up an account for you. Um, then spent a week with HSBC, eventually got an account opened up. Um, but then transferring money from our ANZ bank account to HSBC was a nightmare. We got charged like enormous fees and all those kind of things as well. So, um, you know, I think like that's where Airwax offers a really good solution that, you know, allowing, allowing our customers to open up bank accounts and all these major markets with, you know, two or three clicks of a button. Um, and then, you know, being able to transfer your money from one market to the other at market leading FX rates. And, um, that, you know, it's a really simple and easy thing to do, but um, if you get that right, all of a sudden you can save two, three, four, five percent on your, on your bottom line, just by, you know, opening up the, the right account um, and, and banking infrastructure. So um, for us, that's, you know, why we exist. And I, I think a really important, important thing is that everyone's ex considering their global expansion. Super. Thank you. David Kenny, what do people have to get right in your area? Uh, look, I think it's, um, what, what my do is, is it sort of overlaps to the pool for those things, through those things because, with say, you know, my Australian company, should I make it my European company? What should my, am I using a, a commission model, a commissionaire or a limited risk service provider model so that I've just got limited um, risk in, say, for example, opening a UK subsidiary. I've got a team over there. They, are they charging me for services they provide with a markup or how do I avoid triggering a permanent establishment? So those sorts of things are some of the first few. What countries have royalty withholding taxes? Which ones, how do I structure around that? How do I structure uh, around the payments and withholdings? And um, where do I want to pay tax? Do I want to pay tax in a country where there's franking credits or if I'm a startup, I never want to pay tax until I, I get an exit. So how do I keep all of the money in as tight a format in terms of structuring and and making sure my payroll's right, making sure my r and right. So there's no one thing. It's really just looking at all of it together and putting all the pieces together and saying, we're going to have, um, you know, structural issues down the track by having, you know, a, a, a company in the Philippines that we might be doing some outsourcing to. It's just putting all of those pieces together and understanding how the jigsaw works. So we don't break the law in any countries. We don't pay taxes unnecessarily. We don't, 
um, uh, our flow of funds is, is appropriate. If we've got, as soon as we start lending money to countries, we've got interest charges we might need to make, transfer pricing things. So it is complicated. So it's just really a good idea to get uh, really clear up front what you will do and what the minimum amount of compliance you need to do just to not get in trouble. Um, you don't need it to be perfect. You just need it to be good for now and knowing that when you do get ordered to do a review or if you do get, if you're lucky enough to sell, it will matter that you get this right. So, um, and getting it done as soon as possible is critical because otherwise it always costs more money to fix later. So they're, they're the critical things, I think, Cynthia. Super, thank you. And Chris Horn, from a sales point of view, what is the one thing that companies have to get right as they're expanding overseas? Yeah, well, the one thing. Um, look, I, I think, Cynthia, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier around focus. And I, I think there's kind of two aspects to this. I think one is partly about focus from the, the, the mothership, from HQ. Yeah. So, you know, is expanding into this new market one of the top strategic initiatives for HQ? Uh, or is the local kind of HQ core business really still the main focus, you know, and is, is expanding a, a bit of a side project in reality? You know, so I think that kind of timing aspect there is really important to ensure that HQ is stable and mature enough to really give the new market expansion the, the priority and the, the time that it's going to need. Mm. So I think it's kind of half of it, but I think the, the second and big piece is about focus in terms of the customers that you're really targeting in the new market. Uh, and I, I kind of think this is where there's often a really important moment for many businesses where they need to kind of go back to some of the fundamentals that sometimes they get away with skipping in the, in the home market. And it's stuff like, you know, are you really clear on your brand promise? You know, so who you are as a business, um, what you stand for as a brand, because you're going to have to be absolutely laser guided on that. You know, a really clear view on your segmentation, where you're going to play, which industries or segments are you, are you really going after? And do you have a compelling offering that, that you know is going to resonate there? And I think once you have that focus, it's then about, are you really clear on how are you going to win? You know, is it going to be differentiated functionality, say with your app, or are you going to have additional industry depth? You know, what is it that is going to mean that your go-to-market is going to be better than others? And, um, you know, that might be having a focused account strategy, going deeper than others can, backing it up with account-based marketing, for example, or whatever it is. But, but yeah, I think focus across those two domains would be the one big one. I completely agree with you. I reckon in this space, less is definitely more because if you scale chaos, you just create more chaos. For sure. Fantastic. So each of the companies that we have on the panel today has been internationally successful already. So my question for each of you guys is, what has been the company's secret source for leveraging technology to go global? Who wants to start? Phil, you're unmuted. Go ahead. <laughs> I think um, Alex is a really interesting business in the sense that um, you know, pre, pre-COVID, um, we were probably like 200 people, 150 people. We're now close to 800, right? Um, so yes, the, the growth trajectory is, is crazy. We've actually grown up in a remote world um, and like the, the business is really like the core of the business has grown up in a remote world. So I know this is going to sound boring, but like things like Slack, uh, Google Docs, um, Zoom, all these like collaborative um work softwares that you know most businesses have had to get used to over the last year i think like are innate to our to our organization and um like coming having coming from a previous startup we were using most of these tools anyway i think like the depth of how we're using these tools is like next level right and, and like every day someone's showing me some new tip or trick that we can use, un unlock with some of these these tools that we that we have at our disposal um, that, that really, um, you know, power productivity. So um, I think like a lot of people will like, you know, they'll have Zoom or they'll have Slack, but they're not using it, like they're using 10 or 20% of it, right? So um, really unlocking the power of these tools that most of us use, are using is, is really key to driving, you know, operational efficiency, particularly um, in this remote world that we unfortunately are, are still in and look to be for uh, some time. I love it. Thank you. Who's next? Chris. Happy to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, Salesforce, as we probably all know, has, has had a pretty pretty amazing growth trajectory for a, a, a long period of time. 
you know, we aren't always subtle about it. Like you might see the growth charts on the sides of buses and stuff, which um, is always interesting when you when you work here. Um, but look, in, in all honesty, I don't think our success in growing internationally has been all about technology, maybe ironically in a way. Um, I think it's part of the picture, but I think vision, culture, you know, putting a lot of emphasis on learning from our customers has been a really big part of that. But um, I think on the technology side, I think one thing that we do very well is like we do drink our own champagne in terms of, you know, using our own technology, but importantly, those of our, our ISV partners at the same time as well. And, uh, you know, not, not saying that to kind of spruik Salesforce product. I think it's more about the, the kind of fundamentals that sit behind that. You know, things like we've got a platform that brings all our data together into one place. You know, we've got a network of apps that um, sort of fits very natively together. So there's a very simple ecosystem for, for making people's life easier. Um, you know, simple collaboration tools, you know, that's just um, it's been touched on with Phil there. Um, so Quip and Google Docs are, are right up there on the list for us amongst others. But I think there's the scale piece too, you know, so whether it's things like uh, using a ticketing system for managing HR inquiries or Trailhead as our, our learning platform, you know, I think the business does use technology really well to kind of build centrally and then push these services out globally. Mm -hmm. So then in the markets, in, in the regions, uh, leaders really can focus on selling and growing and just kind of pick up these services and run with them to help them scale their local business as well. Super, thank you. Fred. Yeah, a lot of things already mentioned. Um, for me, there's two aspects. Yes, you've got the IT stack. On, on well, like Salesforce, we can drink our own champagne. That's really cool. We can, uh, we can use our own software. And I would say working remotely really helped us. I think when we speak about extension, it's about people. And I think something we did really well is we prefer to wait on not having someone instead of having the wrong people. So uh, one of the most important things for us was really to build very strong local team with a diverse, uh, diverse profile, but always with the same DNA or core uh, key value. And based on that, we know that in every single country, we've got people who can take good decision. We provide them the right framework. They can innovate inside this framework. And, uh, and, they can, and we provide them the right IT stack to innovate and perform. So people, I mean, we cannot travel. You're going to go to US, you're not going to go and travel to US in the next six, 12, whatever month. So you need to make sure you've got people that represent your brain uh, on our really, really, uh, I'm not going to say a culture fit, but a culture add for your company and you need to trust them. So people is the most important thing you need to look after. I love it. Thank you. And David, lucky last. Oh, we are right out of time because Leo is giving me the time out sign. So I'm going to make this our last comment before we wind the panel up. Okay. Well, I think the two key things, to be honest, are really that the success really depends on two things. One is um, the ability to allocate capital. So being able to build a, a model that actually uh, helps you design what we are spending your capital at speed direction increments if you're putting a dollar in getting it you know six dollars out uh, and being able to articulate that in a way and understanding that you're getting better at that process because uh you know everyone talks about you know a model and they say here my, my sales my price times my volume is it but it's all of the ingredients that go into understanding how your business works and where and when things need to be done to to dictate that um, the, the outputs will, will generate further capital. And that comes from hiring the best people and being able to, uh, in part, get the best people in, involved, being able to allocate capital and also options and make sure your incentives and your remuneration, uh, your options uh, and your culture is right. So to me, uh, the tools that I use most are, are tools that are around capital allocation and um, and hiring and, and um, rewarding people. I think those two things are the, the tools that I use. I think tools that come and go, but, but that doesn't ever change. You've got to get good at capital allocation and people. Fantastic. Fred, David, Chris, Phil, thanks for being an amazing panel. Um, guys, you have heard some, and girls on the call, you've heard some great insights today. Can we give our panel a round of applause, please?
can unmute and applaud if you feel inclined to do so. Leo, I'll hand back to you. Okay, fantastic. Yes, thank, thank you, everyone, um, for the discussion. Before we jump to the... Not how you're doing to... it when we're in business, or not, or else. Hey, David. Um, so, so yeah, before we jump to the, uh, to the last networking session, um, uh, just a few words about your, uh, your, your book launch, uh, Cynthia. What's in, what's in the book? Okay, so I guess if I had to do it in like my th in 30 seconds, this is kind of the high level how to to keep taking your company global. So, I mean, you've heard today on the panel, there is a huge amount of depth to this sub subject and it's very hard to like drill down to every last piece. This book has a go at kind of giving you the A to Z, starting with why would you go global right through to, you know, how do you get your stuff there? How do you build a global team? How do you drill down and find your ideal avatar and then work out, you know, how to get your message out to them and your stuff. So that is what it is about. Um, it is officially coming out tomorrow. Fantastic. And, and thank you. And uh, Cynthia and our team are, are giving us a 50% discount. Um, we'll, uh, you know, you can scan this link um, and we will... Uh, send you more information in the um, wrap-up email. Uh, so without further, uh, another thanks to our sponsor before we uh, kind of heads off to the breaking room. Um, big, big thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, you know, OVH Cloud uh, could see um, Clement and Yan Ling uh, online as well. Thank you so much for, for your support. Uh, Fred with Aircall, uh, Brendan with also in the room with Found Squire, uh, Dave with Old Chadwick, uh, Chris, uh, Salesforce, App Exchange, and uh, Mark Redding uh, uh, from the Atlassian Foundation for Pledge One, uh, pledge one Percent. Um, a big thanks as well to um, Phil from Airwalex, wonderful uh, partner, and definitely a very happy customer of uh, Airwalex as well. Um, let's go to the room, have a, have a chat, and you know, go a bit further in terms of growing our network and helping each other uh, take over the world. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you all had uh, some great discussion and met uh, new people in my room. We had a pretty good connection um, and learned much more about George, uh, Louis' uh, application, helping kids uh, fight anxiety. Uh, very, very exciting and success story in the UK uh, and Australia. Uh, well done, Louise. Um, basically, you know, just a quick wrap up. I think we, uh, you know, all enjoyed the, the discussion and hopefully met some some new people. So uh, we're really looking forward to get your your feedback. See uh, if you liked the um, this uh, this type of um, event. Uh, you know, obviously we love hybrid events and you know being able to travel. You know, at least in Australia. Um, we, we don't know yet when it's going to be possible. Um, and, you know, we really want to keep the, the community, um, you know, vibrant and, and create opportunities for all of us in lockdown to meet new people. Uh, in terms of uh, our next events, uh, tomorrow there's actually uh, a webinar run uh, as part of the OVH Cloud Startup Program around design thinking. Uh, so, you know, if, if you've got some new ideas today, uh, out of today, uh, and around some, you know, new market, that could be a fantastic opportunity for, for all of you to, uh, you know, get more around the, the, the toolbox. Um, also every, um, so twice a month, we having a virtual coffee session. So, uh, literally little agenda, but to meet new people, uh, it's in small group. And, uh, uh the next one is this Friday, the 13th. Um, and follow up uh, late August. Um, you can find the link to register on our online community, and that's for, for members only. Uh, and then our next event uh, will be focusing on fintech. So you, if you are a, a fintech founder, um, and we definitely you know would love to have uh, uh, Brendan uh, or Damian from Fund Squire sharing their story. Um, but we'll be focusing on, on that vertical for, uh, for the next event and then looking forward to resume uh, our events all around Australia 
Adelaide, uh, where we had our last physical event, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, and, and Singapore, uh, where we actually have an ambassador on the ground, also getting um, itchy to resume the, uh, the event. Um, so thanks a lot for uh, you know, providing us feedback. It's pretty uh, good to date. Uh, reach out to uh, Sophie, Florencia, myself, and uh, Divianchi, who uh, joined your team and be, will be helping us um, uh, you know, with any kind of marketing and event management activities uh, in the future. Welcome, Divianchi. Hope you, you liked your first event with us. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it for today. Uh, if you haven't joined the community, you know, and, and you like this type of concept and, you know, want to find more founders uh, and investors in Australia, Asia Pacific, uh, Europe, uh, you're welcome to join us and looking forward to assisting you uh, succeed, grow um, internationally, locally, uh, and helping you, you know, find the right talents for your team. Thanks so, so much, uh, everyone, for joining today. Uh, that's it for us. We'll let you go back to your day. If you are in lockdown like us, don't forget to go out um, and you know, make the most of uh, this great day here in Sydney. Um, we'll see you again very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, all.